good morning. Good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you here. On behalf of our Lord Jesus Christ, we welcome you as we worship today. We have come here today to worship God and to be with each other as God's family. And so we celebrate that every Sunday. We especially want to welcome today our visitors who are here with us. Uh, we also want to welcome those who may be streaming with us for the first time. It is good to have all of you here with us today. It is good to be together. There are some announcements that I want to go ahead and make for all of our uh, information. Uh, first of all, uh, sad news to let you know that Jane Strickland, longtime member of the church, passed away peacefully on August the 18th in Miramar Beach. And so our thoughts and our prayers go out to Jane's family. We are needing folks, liturgists, flower sponsors, and fellowship sponsors. Please sign up on the willing wall, if you will, please. That is right outside in the narthex on this side of the narthex. So please sign up for uh, a flower sponsor, a liturgist, or, um, uh, or a, a, a helper here for us. We need your help for sure. We we'll also want to mention to you that the Bible study, The Chosen, will be today at 12 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And then the uh, following lessons for The Chosen are going to be on September the 29th, October the 6th, and October the 13th. Once we have completed all of those, that will finish season one. Presby are, are we okay? All right, that's a good correction. We are starting the class about 11.30, 11.40, somewhere right in there. So just so you'll know, I think it's going to make a nice seamless transition from fellowship into the, into the Bible study is what I'm thinking. Of. Good, good for y'all, good for y'all. Okay. All right, the Presbyterian Women Birthday Luncheon is going to be on September the 17th, which is Tuesday. And we will be having, it's at 11.30. Uh, they're going to be playing a fun Dirty Labor Day gift exchange during the luncheon. Remember, you can't buy anything for this exchange. Your gifts must come from your home. And so I look forward to something really ugly disappearing from our house uh, for, for, this, for this special day. And we, we, don't have, we don't have any ugly things in our house. Let me back up on that, okay? Uh, no, don't back up on that. But anyhow, uh, maybe they'll have something. So, all right. <laughs> There is going to be a congregational meeting, folks, on Sunday, September the 22nd, for the purpose of electing new elders. And not least, but not, not, I've got two more here I want to mention to you. The annual salad potluck lunch will be on Sunday, September the 22nd, 2024, immediately following the worship service. We are asking you, it's going to be in the fellowship hall, we are asking you to please bring your favorite salad. It can be any kind of salad that you would like. It's going to, be, again, be a wonderful time for a fellowship. Today, we especially want to remember uh, uh, Barbara Blackburn's Bob, her, her significant other, Bob Stevenson. Bob is not well, and so we want to remember Bob in our prayers. We want to support Barbara in our prayers, and so our heart goes out to her and Bob and what's going on and we pray for a speedy recovery. Now, I believe that's all of our announcements, MG. We're good. We're good. And so we do welcome you today again. It's great to be here. And by the way, it's great to be back with you. Mary Nell and I were in Natchez this past, uh, their past um, uh, Sunday. I do want to let you know that I have seen a video going around on the Internet, and the video looks like me in a gambling casino. And I just want to let you know, that that's not me in there, okay? That, that, that's my long-lost twin brother, okay? So just to let you know. Folks, we had a nice time in Natchez. We had such a nice time, and it's such a beautiful city. And we would recommend you're going anytime. It is, it is really pretty there. All right, enough of my weak attempts to be humorous. Um, it is time for us to prepare our hearts for worship let us bow our heads together as I pray for us all. 
O God of the seasons and falling leaves, O God of the world, of spiraling oceans and towering mountains, O God of our lives, of birth and death, and all the moments in between, we praise you this morning for the gift of awareness of this place and its people, awareness of the flowers and the music here, of our bodies, our feelings, our failures, and our futures. Help our voices and our spirits to worship and communion with you during this hour. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As you are able, would you please stand for the call to worship? We observe this day as a Lord's Day, giving thanks to God. God, God gives justice to the oppressed, oppressed forgives us, us, and redeems us. us. God crowns us with a steadfast love and mercy. Let us worship the one who is worthy of our praise. Let us pray. Gracious God, let me make sure I'm right here. <laughs> let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, make us hungry for the heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. I apologize. I, I did out of order. <laughs> We're going to do the uh, call to confession first. Let us lay aside the works of evil and put on a armor of goodness. Let us live honorably putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we confess now. Let us admit, admit our sins before God as we pray together the prayer of confession, print it in the bulletin, followed by a time of quiet meditation. Let us pray. God, our judge, we admit we have double standards. We seek forgiveness for ourselves, but fail to forgive others. We seek relief for ourselves, but fail to seek relief for others. We seek leniency for ourselves, but fail to show that mercy to others. Forgive us, mighty God, and help us to give 
showing others the same grace and mercy that you have generously shown to us. People of God, hear and believe. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but according to God's own steadfast love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our sins from us. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. You will notice in our bulletin here that we have the time for young disciples. We are into the school year now, and we are thinking that we may have young disciples some Sundays. We may not, but anyhow, when they end up coming, I'm going to be ready for them, and they just add something delightful to our church. And so we're not going to do the time for young disciples unless we have children here. We will now have the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what we have commanded. Since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today comes from Psalms 133 on page 575 of the Old Testament if you would like to follow along. The blessedness of unity, Psalm 133. How very good the pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord obtained the blessings, life forevermore. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson today comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. That is on page 201 of the New Testament. Again, Colossians 3, 12 through 17. And this talks about the new life in Christ. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Scripture says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to live in unity. But how hard it is also. It is hard because unlike political parties, church unity is not based on our agreeing with each other. It's not. Church unity is based on our concern for each other. A church is a diverse community built on the solid ground that when all hearts are one, nothing else has to be one. Not our clothes, not our age, not sex, not race, not mindset. A church, again, is a diverse community built on the solid ground that when all hearts are one, nothing else has to be one. In fact, I'm going to maintain with you this morning that a good church ought to be diverse. And in that respect, I think we excel pretty well. Actually, the unity of the church is not an ideal to be realized, but rather it is a fact to be recognized. Again, scripture says, behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to live in unity. Folks, you've probably figured this out by now, but we do not choose our church family. And they do not choose us either. It is God who has made us one. So in church, what we have to do is we have to let go and we have to let God. Let go and let God. You've probably heard that before. We have to let go of our prejudices and our insecurities, our feuds and our feeble hates. And let God's grace guide us into the freedom and intimacy in which God has intended us to live. I'm going to maintain that this morning that Christianity has, has, not been, has not been tried and found wanting, but rather it has been tried and it's been found difficult. And it has been abandoned again and again. Because unity can be so hard, behold how doubly good and pleasant it is when sisters and brothers live in unity. There is another reason that why Christian unity is so difficult. I want you to listen carefully to this, please. It's, it's, it's a little bit abstract, but I know you'll get it. Doing an evil thing does not make a person evil. Okay? But doing an evil thing, seeing that it is evil, calling that evil good and then believing your own lie makes an evil person. If the heart of evil is disguise and the religious godliness is the best possible disguise, where else would we look for evil people if not in the church? Folks, this is no new idea. Centuries ago, Pascal wrote, people never do evil so cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. And didn't Jesus himself warn us when he said, not all who say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. If Christian unity is so difficult and the church is such a hiding place for evil people, we had better ask ourselves, why should we honor the church? Why is the physical presence of other Christians such a, such a spiritual necessity for us? Why do you think that is? Well, you may not like what I'm about to say here, but there is some truth in the comparison of the church to Noah's Ark. And that truth is, is that no one could have stood the stench in the ark had it not been for the storm outside. Folks, life is a storm. Some of you may know or remember the spiritual, 
been in the storm so long, O Lord. You know I've been in the storm so long. Most of us have felt our lives to be as the psalmist described his. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. I have passed out of mind like the one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. Now, this has never happened to me personally, but I think this is how it works. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions here. Have you ever held with cupped hands a bird with a broken wing? I am told that if you open your hands wide, the bird will flutter its wings. It will fall out of your hands and it will die. But the other side of this to the other extreme is if you close your hands and you close your hands too tightly, the bird will also be crushed and die. Now, aren't there cupped hands? Not, not, not cupped in to kill anything, but aren't there times when all of us need cupped hands where our wounds can heal and we can grow? Why is the physical presence of other Christians such a spiritual blessing? Because we got it wrong. We don't win through competition, folks. We win through love. Now, the media shows us people driven by personal ambition and materialism. And the message here is very clear if you've got the money, you can do whatever you want to do. You can, you can do whatever you want to wish, whatever you wish. Just do it. Take your life and make it all your own. Now, hopefully, we are not as selfish as our, as our culture urges us to be. But we all need the church to help us not to be swept up in promotions and financial success to remind us that we can't possess our souls by possessing things outside of our souls. We need to recall that the only truly renewable resources are spiritual. We need to remember, folks, that we are not defined by what we have, by what we possess, but by who we are and that we are as we love. We are as we love. Paul says that if we fail in love, we fail in all things. We need the physical presence of other Christians for worship, to sing psalms and hymns with thankfulness in our hearts to God, whose greatness is greater than our words can ever, ever describe. We need the church to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And that brings us to the heart of our difficulties in this or in any church. Folks, evil people are not the problem here. Henry Nouwen writes, the agenda of our world, the issues and items that fill newspapers and newscasts, is an agenda of fear and power. Evil people, again, are not the problem. But it's frightening to see how easily that agenda becomes our agenda, to see how the world seduces us into accepting its fearful questions. Now and asks us to consider the, the enormous number of what-if questions that can fill our minds. Here's some of them. What's going to happen to me if I don't find a best friend? Everybody needs a best friend. What if I don't find a house or some sort of suitable living arrangement that I can afford or is good for me? What if I can't find some sort of fulfilling hobby in my retirement now that I'm retired and I need to have something productive to do? What if I get sick? What happens if our marriage is seems to be stumbling after retirement and we're just having a hard time getting along and we struggle hard and we're not happy. What if I am mugged? 
As Nowen notes, the trouble with fearful questions, friends, is that they never lead to love-filled answers. Fearful questions, there is not one thing good that comes out of it. Fear cannot give birth to love, only to more fear. So for a community of faith to become a true church, its members must strain to hear the voice to which we have become all but deaf. We must hear the voice that says, do not be afraid, have no fear. This voice was heard by Zechariah when the angel Gabriel appeared to him in the temple and told him that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son. This voice was heard by Mary when the same angel entered her house in Nazareth. This same angel announced that Mary would conceive and bear a child and name him Jesus. This voice was also heard by the women who came to the tomb, and they saw that the stone was rolled away. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not be afraid. The voice uttering these words, do not be afraid, sound all throughout history as the voice of God's messengers, be they angels or be they saints. It is the voice that announces a whole new way of being, of being in the house of love, the house of the Lord. A church, folks, is a place where we can think, a place where we can speak, a place where we can act in God's way, not in the way of a fear-filled world. A church, I believe, is a home for love, a home for brothers and sisters to live in unity, to rest and be healed, to let go of our defenses and to be set free, free from worries, free from tensions, free to laugh, even free to cry. Now, I said when I began this sermon that at the beginning that we had to let go and let God's grace lead us into the freedom and intimacy in which God has intended us to live. Folks, fear destroys intimacy. On one hand, fear distances us from each other because we are afraid. But on the other side of this, and there is another side, the other side is that fear makes us cling to each other, which is the death of freedom. Fear has so many doors to let life out. Love alone can recreate life. Only love can create intimacy and freedom too. For when all hearts are one, as scripture says, nothing else has to be one. Not our clothes, not our age, not our sex, not our race, not our mindset. Look, in being diverse, we here at First Presbyterian Church, we are not doing that badly, quite honestly. But the two words, never enough, describe the best of us. Today, friends, God is calling out our hearts for review. We are too, we are too full of the fear that love is supposed to cast out. God wants our unsurrendered souls, souls that we squeeze so tightly that they shrink to the size of our hands. Unsurrendered to God, our souls are fearful. Surrendered, our souls fill, are filled with the love that only God's grace can provide. Again, behold how good and pleasant and absolutely necessary it is for brothers and sisters to dwell in unity. Brothers and sisters, I don't experience this as a quarreling church. I really don't. But when we quarrel, we know we are still family. When we disagree with each other, we know that we are still family. 
And that is why the physical presence of, of everyone here is such a spiritual blessing to all the rest. That is why we take time every Sunday to have fellowship in our fellowship hall and enjoy each other. Look around you this morning. Look around you when we get to the fellowship hall today and behold and believe how good and pleasant it is to be together. I'm a big baseball fan. My whole family is. And so I love baseball analogies or illustrations. And I, here's a good one. It goes back a ways. But in New York City, where the New York Mets play baseball, these words are, hidden, are, are written high above the bleachers. And it's a very short statement. And the statement is, baseball like it ought to be. Baseball like it ought to be. Folks, we don't need to hang up a sign to remind us of who we are. But let's be church like it ought to be. Let's be church like it ought to be. Amen. Our affirmation of faith is printed in our bulletin. Let us stand together now and say what we believe. We believe that God is spirit and that those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. We believe that God is light and that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We believe that God is love and that everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that in him we have life now and forever. We believe that as Christ loves us, so we must love one another. And we believe that salvation and glory and power belong to our God, who reigns forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We invite you today to profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. We also invite you to unite with us in church membership. If you are interested in membership or in discipleship, please see me after this service of worship today. 
As we present our offerings today, may we be aware that what we give serves Christ's kingdom, not just here, but all over the world. Let us pray. O oh God, we have and possess more than we could ever want. Give us now the gift of gratitude that we may see your goodness and be moved to share what we have with the poor and broken and neglected of this world. Through Christ our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, whose kindness to us has taken forms we have never known and visited us in ways we did not see, we thank you today for your, for your countless mercies for us. We thank you for friends who rescue us from loneliness. We thank you for family members who stand by us in times of adversity. We thank you for churches that teach the way of faith, that books that embody reflection and ideas, for Bibles that impart sacred history and understanding, for teachers who shape our lives, for work that can give us purpose, for sleep that restores, for play that rejuvenates, for prayer that sustains us. Forgive us, O oh God, we pray, for ever taking anything for granted and for not acknowledging that you are the giver of every true and perfect gift. O oh God, grant that your spirit may move among us in this place, generating new faith, healing wounds, causing fellowship, 
and filling hearts with joy and love. Teach us to share with one another the wonderful gifts you have given us. And then, encouraged by a common spirit of generosity, to reach beyond these walls with love and service and gifts for others. Let the vision of wholeness and commitment that was in Christ be in us also. And let your name be glorified here and in all the earth. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may God, whose peace passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in eternal blessedness today and evermore. Amen.